Thank you for joining us for Unhealthy Homes Challenges and Promising Interventions in Northeast Ohio. My name is Wanda Ali Matlock. I'm a senior consultant at Better Health Partnership, and I'm pleased to be your host. This webinar is the first in a series that explore important issues in our children's health initiative. Before I introduce our presenter, I would like to briefly acquaint those of you who may be unfamiliar with Better Health Partnership. The partnership is a is the only nonprofit regional health improvement collaborative, and we're dedicated to improving the health of our community. Our mission is to provide a safe space for healthcare competitors to collaborate on common problems and share innovative best practices. Our members include more than 1,000 primary care clinicians. Uh oh. Members include more than one than primary care clinician, all 70 sites, and 16 health systems. Our members range from small health centers to the region's largest health systems and include the public health department, allied health com and community-based organizations, all working together to improve the health of our community within a diverse population within Northeast Ohio. If you want to learn more about Better Health Partnership, please visit our website at healthpartnership.org. I will give you a few housekeeping rules uh, before we continue. You, all participants, uh, your computers will be placed on mute during the duration of the call. We have time for questions at the end of Mrs. Foreman's presentation. If you have a question, please type it into the question box, and we will answer your question during the presentation. Um, of the, the question portion of the presentation. If any time during your presentation you have difficulty, send us a message via the chat box or have te technical difficulty uh, via the QA uh, box. And if you have difficulty uh, technically, please dial 216-978-5444. And at the end of this presentation, you will receive a survey, and we will ask that you take a moment to complete it because your feedback is important to us. Next slide. Now I'd like to introduce you to Ms. Kim Foreman. She has more than 20 years of experience on justice issues in Cleveland. She has been an environmental health watcher since 1999. She has served as the executive director since 2015. Executive director, Kim has focused on adverse outcomes of environmental exposures, both indoors and outdoors, that disproportionately affect poor and minority communities. She has a bachelor's degree in sociology from Case Western Reserve University. She licensed lead risk assessor and instructor for Roots of Success, an educational program that prepares youth and adults for environmental health careers and to improve the conditions in their community. Ladies and gentlemen, let's welcome Ms. Kim Foreman. And Kim, please take over. Thank you. Thank you. First, I want to thank Better Health for inviting me to have this discussion today. And this is my first webinar, so I uh, hope I do a good job. So today, um, our objectives are to um, understand the current problem with housing quality in Cleveland, talk about asthma and lead hazards in homes, understand some of the barriers to addressing those issues and hazards, and also learn a little bit about on-the-ground application, models of success, and connecting you to resources. So I'm going to briefly touch on asthma and lead, asthma triggers and lead hazards. I do not have time to deep dive or um, discuss what to do and more technical remediation strategies, but I will spend some time focusing on the research and models that, have de that we've developed over time which informs our approach and policy efforts, and I'll try to weave in some stories um, in between the slides. So Environmental Health Watch, our new mission is to create healthy homes and sustainable communities by identifying and removing hazards, educating and inspiring people, and advancing equitable environmental solutions. So we just finished our new strategic plan. Um, maybe some of our partners are on the line and, and can add to the discussion. Um, hopefully I have new information to share. Uh, some of you who have listened for a while can also um, chime in um, if I leave anything out. So Environmental Health Watch has been at this for a long time, and we sit with this holistic um, approach and understanding how many of the folks that we work with, children specifically, um, who might have um, lead poison also have asthma or have a sibling with asthma. 
98-99, I started at Environmental Health Watch. We were working with um, Cleveland Department of Public Health on the Lent Plus Asthma Project. We integrated um, environmental health and housing, and we applied some holistic approaches to the indoor hazards and triggers. I um, also participated in a national project funded by the National Center for Healthy Homes, Tenants for Healthy Homes, in 2007-9. to nine. And we actually engaged residents, trained uh, local leaders on how to um, conduct dust wipes or, or how to assess a home and then report back to the residents where they live and um, the housing uh, where they live to start to have them understand and lead the effort in affecting the housing. Um, this was also uh, introduced to us through the Community Environmental Health Resource Center, uh, which was called SEARCH, was the national project in 2004. We've also been a part and a major part of the Healthy Homes Advisory Council. And in 2007, the Healthy House Re Advisory Council suggested that we reduce our action level in Cuyahoga County lead poison children to five. And then in 2007, I'm sorry, that was in 2004. In 2007, 2007 we reduced it. In 2014, excuse me, Centers of Disease Control followed. And they also reduced the uh, number nationally to find the action level. So we have a lot of long history and partnerships in Cleveland. So not just for 35 years, we provide direct service advocacy as well as assessments and training. A standing environmental organization based in the Cleveland area that provides direct service to both populations. So I, I'm privileged to work at a grassroots level as well as work on a lot of advisory committees and boards. So a small organization, so the only way we get this work done is through partnership and collaboration. We have a lot of technical expertise, knowledge, and the research really serves us well in understanding. Um, part of our process is to test, demonstrate, and promote model programs, which also informs us about the policies we need to support. Let's talk a little bit about history and the quality of housing in Cleveland. I uh, know that a lot of our housing is older. It actually doesn't just affect folks who live in Cleveland, but also any house you live in that's older could potentially have uh, hazards or issues. But we know that a lot of times folks do not have the resources to maintain their properties. We have a lot of low income or absentee landlords and homeowners who are trying to do the right thing, but just either don't have the information or the resources. We had, if we have 90,000 homes in the city of Cleveland, half of those homes are being rented. So there's no ownership there. Um, and we teach renters a lot of times what they can do to have a safer home, but technically that structure is not their responsibility. The maintenance of that structure is not their responsibility. We have high poverty rates. We know that lead poison and asthma are health conditions that are both related to uh, substandard housing. And we want to focus on housing, we move from house to house, but it focus on the housing stock and, and policies that stabilize our housing stock. We can reduce risk for families. Uh, we didn't just get this way, and so a lot of times when I have these conversations, I really want to frame it with understanding that there are some uh, policies that are long-term policies uh, that have residual impacts that to be taken into account when we design solutions for today. So uh, Kerwin Institute as a Plague Matters team, which is now the Center for Achieving Equity, uh, came together uh, with Iowa State and produced this brief around real estate redlining um, and how those um, policies impact us today. So when I talk about neighborhood conditions or housing conditions, I also want to bring this element of systemic um, issues or policies that impact us. Um, didn't just happen, so it might take us a while to get out of it, but if we really want to get at root causes, we need to understand historically how um, these things happen. This investment um, it creates a lot of different issues for families, but we're not trying to tackle every single one. We have to figure out what our lane is, come together, and collectively we can actually create better, healthier, and sustainable communities, but there's multiple impacts often felt um, within the same communities or by the same folks. So they're experiencing these things. We need to start to unpack it and understand 
how are these factors create unhealthy environments and communities? Um, Some of you might have heard about the um, life expectancy differences in Cleveland. I just left D.C. as a practical playbook conference, and once again, Cleveland it was lifted up as having the worst disparity between us and Lindhurst. So with this, um, where you live, your race, ethnicity, or socioeconomic status should not play a role in how healthy we are, what type of housing we live in, but unfortunately, for many folks, um, this is an issue. And so we talk about health disparities. We need to also understand um, where and how we need to focus our resources um, on data. And that's a big part of how we prioritize and how we start to construct and look at solutions. Some of you might have heard about the social determinants of health or not, but research indicates much of disparity is associated with social and environmental issues such stress, body racism, violence, discrimination, and health services, food insecurity. So this um, model is uh, from County Health Rankings. This is a chart and model they developed. And actually I did um, put them as a resource for folks to learn a little bit more about what should the terms of health are and what types of things we're looking at in regard to root causes, upstream approaches, and systematic changes that need to happen. Um, you know, policies and programs impact health factors and health outcomes, but we can't not just focus on a programmatic solution. We have to connect it to policies, and we have to be more holistic about uh, our approaches. If you look at this chart, social and environmental factors and the physical environment make up 50% um, of the cadres that point toward health outcomes for folks. So this health equity. Health equity, we're trying to attain the highest level of health for all people. It's efforts to ensure that all people have full and equal access to opportunities that enable them to lead uh, lives. So our approach, the work we do is always with the healthy equity and environmental justice frame. It's not, equity is not equality. If there's no one size fits all of them, we need strategies based on history, culture, and meet people where they are, spend time listening, and partner with community to move the needle and realize um, better health outcomes. So I'm going to talk a little bit about that intersection and how housing conditions create hazards which lead to health problems. And elderly are most at risk. Seniors and children spend over 90% of their time indoors which is greater exposure and increased vulnerability. Now, this is a list of 20 hazards in homes, but this was a health home rating uh, system adopted in the UK in 2006. This was adopted in England as the prescribed method for evaluating risk to residents from conditions found in the home. Now, Environmental Health Watch, we have an assessment tool as well, um, which is a lot more simplified, <laughs> but we currently use this rating system as part of the City of Cleveland Hood and Hazard Control pro um, Program. So even though we're uh, assessing lead and looking for lead hazards, we also integrate this healthy homes component and rate um, the risk and for the families um, in the home. It's not a standard, but it's just a rating of hazards for potential harm to residents and it includes safety as well. Here's the common conditions that lead to hazards which also impact health um, in the home. And we have uh, looked at um, remediating using moderate and low level um, interventions. Um, that's our niche and our lane. Um, if there's more that needs to be done, like roof replacement and things like that, we don't cover those things. And we try to send folks um, to resources or connect them with people in the community that could potentially assist them. Even though we do uh, moderate, low-level interventions, uh, they have shown um, improvement, and we have been successful with that model. So these are the types of issues related to an unhealthy home, and sometimes we go in folks' homes and they are um, using their uh, stove to heat the home. If there's safety concerns, they might nail the windows shut, which is not uh, really good for ventilation. And so 
these are some of the things that are going on in the home. Also, I do want to say that you, we can't assume just because someone has a clutter home that they have lead hazards, right? So we, also, we do a visual, but we also test to make sure that what we're seeing is truly a hazard. Clutter just means it's hard to clean, but it's uh, not a subjective um, situation, meaning that my clutter is different from your clutter. So we don't go in folks' homes and try to judge them or tell them um, what they need to do. We always talk about um, these issues in relation to health and hazards, right? I, uh, in a judgmental fashion, telling folks how they need to clean up their house. Um, we deal with contamination and we deal with cleaning for contamination. So the difference is going in to do an inspection versus a home visit. And so our model really emphasizes this equity approach and working with the residents to get them um, to a better place so they can um, have a healthier environment. So we don't blame the victim, but we know that sometimes residents <laughs> use bleach and uh, ammonia to clean, which is something they bring in themselves, which is horrible. Uh, candles, incense, things like that. And a lot of times people don't even realize um, how they're impacting the air quality in their home. Some problems are with the building, and which I talked about earlier is the home or landlord. And then we do have um, health and housing departments which are resources for families and funding to help reduce some of the hazards in the home. So we all take a part in the success of creating a healthy environment, and it's a shared responsibility. I'll we'll talk specifically about lay hazards and then a, a few slides around asthma triggers. So this slide um, that I'm showing you, this is a comparison between 20, 2004 and 2014. And so this is kind of a result of a collaborative approach to a problem in our community, which we are still talking about today. I mean, we've been working on this for days, but part of the Healthy House Advisory Council, a mission of the Healthy House Advisory Council was to foster collaborations among community partners to assess, reduce, and prevent illness and unintentional intentional injuries associated with indoor environments. So working with um, the Healthy House Advisory Council, we were able to work with um, Caja Metropolitan Housing Authority, and like I said, we reduced the action level to five as well. But this is um, on the right side. Um, this is where we are, where we were in 2014, and we still have a lot of problems. We still have um, housing um, deteriorating in um, areas where some of the census tracts have 30% of the children who are tested. Um, have uh, EVLs or elevated blood lead. And so we know that we still have a long way to go, but we can um, make these changes if we work together. So we also understand that these are only um, results and data that, that's displayed which have actually received a test. We do another map from Carwin. I didn't put it in this um, presentation that shows the amount of children that probably are not getting tested. So we still need to understand that this is only representative of those folks that actually get the confirmed um, blood lead test done. So the way to know is if the child is tested, and the only way to know um, if we have their hazards is actually to test the home as well. Um, in East Cleveland, we have a big problem as well in, um, in, the, um, in the suburbs, in the first range suburbs. There's no safe level of lead in the blood. Um, what circulates in the blood for a certain amount of time, it deposits in the bone. And I won't get into all of that today, but um, there are some real issues related to pregnancy, lead, and actually the redistribution of lead into the body if the body is stressed or you're pregnant, things like that. So, like I said, we, most of us live in homes that are built before 1950. The question is, is it maintained, is the paint chipping, inflating, or is it kept up? So therefore, you got lead in your home. It's not really a hazard because it's covered or the paint is kept up. It was banned in 1978, and um, lead and gasoline is actually um, deposited in our soil. So if you have exposed soil, then you have a, a hazard there. So lead didn't go anywhere. It was just deposited in our soil, even though it was taken out of ga gasoline in the 80s. So 
just a visual representation of what a potential hazard could look like. What I do want to say is I do not believe in a lead check swab. The only way to confirm if there's actually lead present is to do an actual dust wipe for lead dust and do paint sampling or take the paint to the lab to get a confirmation. You can look at the um, chip paint. You can work as if it's lead if you live in an older home. But the check, little stick that you might be able to get from Home Depot, wipe a surface, it'll turn pink, not, but it could give you false readings, and that does not tell you how much lead is in that um, dust or how much lead is in that paint. So you still need to go further and understand. Just because you have uh, on the bottom right, you have a paint failure there, it's a moisture problem, but just because it looks bad doesn't mean it's lead either. So that's why we always want to confirm uh, with a test for um, testing. So this is um, a slide just indicating that 80 87% of houses um, probably lay of paint that were built before 1940. Uh, our houses, about 40% of the houses contain lead based paint um, because it's so old. So we all kind of live with this, but we can live in live safe housing. And that's the message too. So folks who really don't understand this issue, we can't live in an older house. We can't live in a, a safe home. We just need to realize and understand the conditions that contribute to the, um, the issues and the problems. So children, most part, do not get poisoned by eating paint chips. Chips turn into dust, which get ground up in, in our household dust. So at times when children are crawling on the floor, putting their hands in their mouth, that's how our children are getting poisoned. Not because they went and picked up a paint chip, although that does happen, but we need to understand that you can't visibly see lead. You can't visibly see lead dust, and it doesn't take a lot to poison. And um, the standards also for the um, lead on floors are being revised as well. So stricter now. Doors. Um, we're constantly um, bumping doors against walls and lifting and closing windows. So that also produces a lot of dust in the window wells and window sills. That there has been an emphasis on um, replacing windows. Um, don't have to replace windows to to clean up the dust, but it is a measure. But just to say that even if you have vinyl window windows, you still can have lead dust. So just because someone gets uh, Rehab or vinyl windows doesn't mean that house is lead free. It depends on what all was done. It doesn't mean that the house is lead free. And we always need to be aware of that as a hazard. Also, uh, um, in toys, um, Senator Sherry Brown came and did, uh, always uh, has press conferences around lead and the issues with lead. But at a certain point, there were a lot of um, toys uh, coming to the U.S. that had lead in them. A child actually swallowed, I believe, this um, clip that came with a pair of Reebok tennis shoes and actually died from lead poisoning because of um, them eating or swallowing this um, cho this choker or whatever it was. So uh, we do have to understand there are other sources. And uh, when we do investigations in home, home EBO you know, children, uh, we have to interview the families and understand all of those um, issues that could have created the situation of a lead poisoned child. Just the asthma. And I'll put um, some stats off of the uh, of High Partner Health site and found that 66,000 emergency uh, room visits happened in 2012 in Ohio. Uh, one in five children below the poverty level in Ohio have asthma. One in five black children in Ohio have asthma. In Ohio, in 2012, more than 17,000 inpatient hospital visits were for, for asthma, which is a rate of 15.1 visits per 10,000. But in Cuyahoga County, 2,720 visits were made for asthma, at a rate of 28.8 per 10,000 residents. So Ohio, in 2012, more than 65,000 emergency department room visits were uh, made in the county. 8,717 visits were made for asthma, um, which is a rate at 68.6 per 10,000. So in Cuyahoga County, obviously we have a problem 
here uh, with asthma, and it's very complicated. I'm not a doctor, um, but we focus on those triggers in the homes that could reduce asthma attacks because we know that a lot of families and children in a school day. So this is another map to kind of show you our geography and where uh, where uh, emergency room visits from Metro UH and Cleveland Clinic. Um, so I tried to find a, a better source, but this is what I uh, found. So this just gives you another picture of the severity of asthma uh, from 2009 to, to August 2009 to July 2010. So this picture is actually a drawing uh, that was submitted by a child with asthma really represents what it felt like to have an asthma attack. So we use this picture because I don't have asthma. Some of us who don't have asthma really don't understand what it might feel like if you can't breathe. And so this is um, this young man drew and submitted. Um, a lot of times people do hair and asthma, but also if you were born prematurely, um, your birth weight was low, your mom smoked, your parents smoked, or you have been um, um, exposed to a lot of these environmental um, hazards like roaches, mice, and things like that, molds, you could actually develop asthma as well. So that they, the um, asthma triggered exposures can cause as well as develop uh, asthma, but we want to focus on indoor allergens and irritants as focus for this conversation. Forty percent of risk of asthma for minority children are attributed to residential triggers. So allergens only affect folks who are sensitized, but irritants can affect anybody. Smoke particles, strong odors, like bleach and, and things like that can cause an asthma attack and can cause problems for lungs. So asthma proteins, dust mite feces, pet dander, skin, skin and mice urine. Um, are all triggers um, and allergens. We test for mold, but we know that um, if surf like wood, carpeting, clothing, drywall gets um, wet, that is a concern for us, and the toxic mold grows on that. Mold in our environment, but when there's moisture source, we have problems. If, there's, if it's visible, there's no need to test. We know that there's an issue. Dust mite and uh, mattress covers are usually given to control the accumulation of dust mites and reduce the excess um, for asthmatic. These are the irritants, uh, tobacco smoke, even perfumes, uh, people usually spray for roaches, that's also a trigger, um, pesticides, and so we also have worked on research to show how we can reduce that pesticide exposure and pesticides that are more effective. We can't go in homes and um, demand change to just give information, assist with routine health remediation, and try to help families decide on which action steps um, they can take. Always a major issue. Um, we have to deal with the moisture source before removing most of the items, uh, which can lead to paint failure and produce lead hazards. Um, usually we give HEPA vacuums as a part of all of our programs, which um, families reduce contaminated dust. Focus, um, oftentimes on a visit, we introduce these tricks to families, so we also try to focus on what parents can do to develop plans, and we usually try to focus on the bedroom, the moving um, dogs or straw odors, dust catchers like stuffed animals, remove those items out of the child's bedroom, so that you could close the door and really try to focus on creating a safe space within the house in the bedroom where the asthmatic must stay. So, this is what we aim for is for a healthier habitat. So, these are um, some goals um, that we try to get to um, creating a healthier home. And so, there's some uh, pieces and parts that we can add to a family, like give them. Um, uh, shelving or give them plastic bins and take out uh, cardboard and take out old um, molded products so they can create a healthier home for folks. So, <laughs> a lot on the <this> slide, <laughs> but I just threw up all the different issues and bears. And I guess this is kind of uh, messy, and sometimes it does get a little messy. 
But I also talked uh, about the, the tenant population. Um, they're, they're associated sometimes with being a tent, not want to complain, not understanding that there's a law that protects them. And so if they move out of one situation, more than likely they're going to move into another house that has some hazards. And sometimes landlords are unaware of the laws and they, they try to evict the tenant because they might have lead hazards. Um, so we try to help with compliance assistance. Um, there's a still a lack of awareness about and housing and asthma and those related to health and housing, so we continue to educate about um, the connections. Sometimes there's some siloed approaches to the work. Uh, some of this conversation is new for folks, so we are um, trying to get folks out of their silos in a collaborative approach is best. And in different sectors around the table that to understand their role in reducing these um, for families. Um, gun housing demolition is <laughs> not necessary for safer housing. Sometimes when we have a conversation, um, folks want to go there or go straight to window replacement. That's not always necessary. Um, and we can um, apply interim controls and things like that or some low-cost, low-level remediation strategies to produce a safer environment. And so also we focus on policy. Funding is limited. The programs that we get and the resources we receive, we like that and we're happy to get them. But we understand that um, those programs are limited. If we have 9,000 uh, units or real units and we can only fix 200 units with a HUD program, we need to look at a different way that it impacts folks. Policy for one. So that um, it gets complicated sometimes. But I think it's something we could do. There's models out there. And so gentrification is a concern that comes up a lot um, by law. Um, the city has to plant their homes with EBL children, but there's also a concern about displacing those families as well. So I'll talk a little bit about um, some work we've done. Some of these studies, most of them I've been a part of, uh, so I haven't. Uh, because we've been doing um, this a long time, we also have done research all the all 35 years of work. Uh, I was uh, with the Invest in Children, a primary lead prevention um, research project. I was the main educator. So I went to homes initially, did education, remediation happened. Uh, that cost was approximately uh, $3,000 or less. So the work that was done was very low level. I went back at six and 12 months did dust wipes and then tried to understand what um, the uh, families retained and what action steps they took between visits. Also, uh, the asthma Brazilian children as a result of harm um, more than moisture sources. I just had come to Environmental Health Watch around that time, but more moisture is a major issue for infants, and I know Dr. Dearborn um, we work with him all the time, so he's our, our main researcher. He's retired now, but um, he's still around. We do a lot of work with Dr. Dearborn, so our models have been um, developed and refined over time uh, doing a lot of this work. So this is how we learned a lot about mold and moisture and that um, you don't need to uh, test for mold. If you see it, we need to remove it. So um, was an interesting study for integrated pet management and roaches and asthma. Uh, we become a leader in uh, <laughs> this uh, field because we worked in CMHA housing and actually uh, took a lot of samples with Q-tips on the floor to understand proteins and roaches and how uh, clean those proteins and allergens up help the asthmatic in the home. So this was a very interesting project. We um, Use a vacuum. We use heat guns to flush roaches out. This is where we learned the strategies uh, around pesticides and using um, tail baits and bait stations in in, um, in homes to reduce um, roach roaches and um, infestation and the spraying, bombing, and fogging. So the healthy homes and patients um, program that we did that for about four or five years with Dr. Dearborn. And this was a great example of how um, doctors uh, come out into the community, come into the home to kind of understand the intersection 
of what patients are experiencing in a home, their environment, and those things that lead them to the doctor or lead them uh, to, to get a emergency room visit or have problems. So a very eye-opening experience for the um, physician, and I feel like they learned a lot through this project. Aquar Tyler, who is our director of Healthy Homes and Training, he does a lot of this work as we find um, these protocols with Dr. Dearborn and Superbird over time. I'm going to talk a little bit about our Build Health Challenge, where we are today, how we've incorporated um, some of the models and approaches in our, our Build Health Challenge work. Um, in 2015, we were one of seven implementation sites. Three, actually, three of the sites are actually focused on housing. We received this funding, and it was an opportunity for a nonprofit organization to take a leadership role working with the healthcare system and health department. We ended our partnership to include Spanish American Committee, Hispanic Alliance, Building Housing, Metro West Community Development Corporation, and Sandy Chappelle from the Center for Achievement Equity, which is a formerly placed matters. Uh, we then Clark Fulton area, therefore we really wanted to include those institutions and partners who were in the community and could help us get the work done. This is the first time funders pull um, fund support nonprofit. But cash dollars were required from the health system. BUILD stands for Bold, Upstream, Integrated, Local, and Data uh, Driven. So the little show to the charts to help us talk to you about, this was a way to actually fund the work and learn from the approaches that the different cities took. There's been a lot of buzz around the BUILD Health Challenge, and we, we could be a part of it. And Cleveland has been recognized as an exemplar site uh, for this project. We will focus on code enforcement, policy change, and a different approach um, in upstream strategies. So we really focused on data integration. We uh, focused on policies and systems change. We do have a direct service component to this, but our focus was the policy change and code enforcement um, going into this. That's why we wanted to include the housing and folks make decisions uh, at, at the table. I was able uh, to put forward a policy change. Um, at, uh, the city is now, the building and housing department is now moving um, to implement a proactive inspection program. Uh, the media was uh, very instrumental in getting folks um, to pay attention to it. Um, the uh, Cleveland Plain Dealers started um, in articles weekly talking about lead and digging deep into the issue. Uh, we are, our direct service component includes 50 home visits. 25 of those, of those visits are referrals from Metro Health with um, patients who have asthma. We match those um, patients in the database with whole housing code violation data. And that's, we found matches in our target um, area. And so those are the uh, folks we are um, trying to get in their homes in the system. So I heard <laughs> the New York Times has been to Cleveland. Al Jazeera um, put together a documentary as well. So if you want to learn more about um, issues around lead, you can look at the Toxic Neglect Lead series. Uh, we had articles in Cleveland, a plain dealer, for several years, even talking about asthma and housing and things like that. So this conversation uh, has been around for a while, especially in Cleveland. Uh, we are healthy health pioneers, so we've always um, kind of pushed for this integration. Five for a second round of bill, but we included University Hospital. I'm glad they signed on. Um, Neighborhood Connection signed on as part of Great University Circle Work and Digital C. So we've um, been able to expand um, the seller system at the city to include data as also a portal for residents to access. This around, we really want to make that access of easier for residents to look for healthier homes and work with the hospital systems, um, integrating their housing data with um, asthma patient data or whatever. We'll develop it further if we get funded. Um, so HealthWatch is also developing tools uh, to implement a free-for-service program, which is based on our model. And so we continue to advocate for payers to uh, for a home visit. So 
We know what the disparities, we know what works, so now we need to institutionalize it so that we can get uh, paid for the home visit as a part of the care of asthma patients. Um, to end, uh, at the start of the presentation, I mentioned how historical policies impact us today. Um, the national and local conversations um, going on about this upstream approach, system change, root causes, and elected impact and equity. So we need to keep um, changing the map so we can tell a different story about how we successfully eliminated disparities and created healthier communities. Here are resources for you and my information. Well, Sam, uh, for that, and we have a few questions that came in. Uh, the first question uh, came in and is, um, they want that assessment tool that you have with the 29 points, is that available? I know you mentioned that that was from a different, uh, from the UK now, you have less. Oh, it's at Housing and Urban Development. So the United States Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, mm -hmm. is utilizing that assessment. So yes, it's available. Okay. We have a couple more other questions coming in. Is there any um, other points you want to stress in reference to uh, home assessments that would tie to that um, tool? Oh, the assessment tool, there's several. It's not the only tool. That's just been recognized by HUD to start to utilize the Healthy Homes Approach, even the LED um, program. So we have develop assessments and simple, simpler assessments. So that is the work we're doing now is a kind of refine our tool, create a product out of it, and so that we can um, use our healthy homes assessment and, and provide services for folks. Another question. They all want to know, will your slides be available? And the answer is yes. We will have them posted on our Better Health Partnership website. I have another question that came in. It said, can you tell us more about the home inspection program at the city of Cleveland? Uh, no. So I can tell you that. <laughs> this year, uh, I believe the goal is to complete 2,500 assessments. The health department has provided those principles of healthy homes to building the housing. But building the housing is really looking at code violations, and I can't really tell you anything else as far as if they're expanding that. Um, basic uh, assessment that they're doing. That the the great thing is that now they're looking at getting in the homes before shifting from a complaint based to a proactive and preventative system. That's what we're excited about. Yes. All right. Another one that go that I think it ties in with the question that you've just been answering. Um, and it can be twofold. What kind? Of, what can a clinician do? Um, you know, for their patients, and my other part of the question, or the other part of the question is, what training or resources can be made available to help uh, clinicians really to understand the scope of the problem? So what can do and what resources to help them understand the scope of the problem? I think that's what they're getting. Yeah. So, so I, I just mentioned, I just left D.C. Uh, with the practical playbook um, meeting, and there's uh, physicians that attended, hospital systems that attended. The yeah, health, you know, and um, multi-sector, right? But they really focus on the clinical approach and what what else physicians could do, hospital systems can do, and health departments can do. So I think that that practical playbook, um, I think I provided it and the resources um, would be great. And um, the county health ranking, um, you could use that as well. And next we have support on the website. So if you look at our county, it's uh, I think it was for 65 out of 88. Um, I actually have a button to say, well, if you want to do something about this or you need some assistance, click the button. So I believe there's a lot of uh, help and resources. Knowing that this is a new way of looking at public health, there's a lot of support if you do want to um, do something different or probably uh, different, learn more. Um, a question came in, and they seem to be related to um, you, could you talk more about advocating for MCOs or for this service that can be reimbursed because it does have an impact on the patients going out of the hospital? Mm -hmm. So speak a little bit of that if you know what's been done in that space. Now, there are a lot of models across the country. Um, we are working right now on a pilot with a managed care organization to look at and evaluate cost savings for the hospital systems. 
So know that uh, what we do in the home works and reduce asthma exacerbations. We've shown that our model, we can reduce exacerbations by 58%. Now we need to understand what, how it translates to cost savings um, for systems. So we're working on that now, and so we hopefully can evaluate that um, by the end of this year or early next year, um, working through the pilot and with our partners now. Good news. Uh, I know I learned a lot uh, because you always think that the uh, you see the picture of the child eating the paint, but little things like death, uh, dust and the gasoline emission in the soil. So that's, that was a big eye opener for me. Mm -hmm. uh, is there any um, waiting to see? I think those questions that are coming in, you've addressed them. Um, think, uh, a lot of our uh, participants seem to have the same. Uh, Concern is like what we can do as health providers, um, what type of tools and resources are available, how to assess them, and then um, the conversation seemed to be around uh, reimbursement because it's a big concern about, you know, issue. Someone has to pay for it, and you mm -hmm. spoke a little bit to that. Any other, um, we have about five more minutes. Is there any other quote marks or questions? Uh, another one coming in is, uh, Okay, uh, another question just came across. Are there programs for families? Mm -hmm. And then, and then, um, you know, if you speak a little bit of that, and I think a lot of times, I think I heard you mention that the programs for the families, a lot are, especially if they live in a, a neglected um, home and they're not the owners of it, they're afraid to speak out. So um, I think that tie in with that question about programs and resources for families, especially if they're able to afraid to speak out, so if you can um, I on that. So I, I provide a link to Community Housing Solutions. Um, they have programs, the city, I believe they have programs for seniors. Um, there's not a lot out there, and then we also have the HUD um, Lead Hazard Control Program. So depending on what resources are available, we try to connect folks, but I also um, make sure I encourage people to talk to their community development corporations in their neighborhoods. They have resources to help with homeowners and folks who might not qualify for the programs. That's a big gap where you might make too much money to qualify for some of these programs, or but you have enough to actually deal with your um, housing conditions or issues. Yeah, that, I think that's a, a, a good place to start, and um, I just want to highlight some of the work that we're doing uh, here at Better Health Partnership, which led us to you know, got to you to do this presentation, and we'll be having another presentation um, that's part of our Children's Health Initiative probably like in August, so we'll make sure our, um, uh, everyone will have an opportunity to get information. But I'll share with you what you were mentioning about the resource, and, and you're right, it's a big problem. A lot of people do not know what resources are available. Mm -hmm. And can you as a first step, and you're filtered out to the organizations that you know, but I want to share is we have a partnership with United Way 211, or people call it First Call for Help, and they have a whole list of resources also. So um, to all of our participants in a call, if you encounter this in your practice, in the school setting, in your community, um, if, if um, you reach out to Environmental Health Watch, the team will be able to assist them, or you can just give them the simple number 211, and 211 also have you listed in their database. So if there's mm -hmm. things that's dealing with the lead, or the healthy homes, they would definitely reach out to you. So what I want to do too, which I've got to mention our own program. Okay. <laughs> we're finishing up, but we're in Clark Fulton at 44109, and we are assisting folks um, in housing that have asthma. We do have some resources limited, but we are still conducting assessments in homes, specifically in the Clark Fulton 4419 area, um, and 211 calls us a lot. Um, but HUD program right now is active. They're taking, um, they're accepting applications. Um, people might need a little hand-holding to complete the application, but um, that's where we use our uh, resources, our community uh, workers and our nonprofits actually assist families in getting those applications completed and um, put into the system so they can get help. We are uh, currently conducting assessments for community um, development right now. I uh, thank you, uh, Kim. And looks like we have answered all the questions. I will encourage everyone on the call. If you have another question, just uh, reach out to uh, Better Health, or you can you know, reach out to 
Environmental Health Watch or call 211 and get your answers um, taken, um, addressed, your questions addressed. Thank you.